Okay, this is brakes test two. Um, and we're going to look at these little true or false statements to begin with. If a vehicle owner reports the brakes lock up during normal use, you should <coughs> check the fluid level in the reservoir and then look for leaks. Well, wait a minute. How is fluid level in the reservoir or leaks going to make the brakes lock up? It sounds more like too much pressure. Or a, kind of a mechanical problem of some kind. Or something sticking. You know, like a caliper piston sticking. So fluid level or leaks are not going to make the brakes lock up. Got me? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, where I'm going? I mean, uh, you can't have a low fluid level. My brakes are locking up because the fluid level is so low. Like if you have leaks, you want to have pressure to the, the wheel cylinders or whatever you have them. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, basically, that's a different kind of problem. I mean, it's going to cause the different symptoms, right? So that's going to be a false right there. When a driver releases the brake pedal, a spring returns the piston in the brake assembly to its original position. Okay, now that is only true if you are, well, uh, the piston in the brake assembly is not returned by a spring. If you're talking about a caliper piston, it's returned by the distortion of that rubber seal. You know, that square seal distorts. However, if you're talking about drum brakes, they are, they are spring retained. So this one here, we're going to put a true on that one, okay? Um, the, uh, as the piston in the brake assembly returns, brake fluid flows from the high pressure uh, chamber. Now this is, uh, you know, like I say, in your book, you're going to see this kind of stuff. The only problem I've got with spoon feeding these answers is sometimes when you guys have got to uh, do this, and I'm not here to spoon feed the answers, you're sitting here with deer in the headlights, duh, I don't know. You know, so you need to be reading these chapters. You get where I'm going? Uh, in your book, you're going to read the chapter. <coughs> Make sure that you, you that you familiarize yourself with this. Now, I've covered some of this in that PowerPoint I did the other day, but make sure you burn this stuff in. If I ask you a question uh, that you're supposed to be able to answer off the top of your head and I, you know, get a huh, you know, I'm gonna, I know there's an issue there. Uh, a front-wheel drive vehicle has got a dual braking system. If one system fails, the other uh, may not be able to stop the vehicle alone. That's actually true. You may have an issue with that. You may be able to, you know, all right. Uh, incidentally, number three, uh, you know, that was a falsy. So they put an F on that one. Okay, number of uh, disc brakes respond more quickly than drum brakes. False? False. That's, uh, well, if that was the case, why are they going with disc brakes on everything? <laughs> you know, think about which way, the, how, the tech, how this industry is going. You get, that's, you know, drum brakes are not going to respond quite as quick. As, as disc brakes are. However, the stopping power available with drum brakes is slightly greater than the, you know, you'd have to have a lot more uh, pad size from the things I read whenever disc brakes first came out, you'd have to have a lot bigger pads to make them stop as well as far as the performance. But the way that they change the pressures and do all the stuff that they do, you know, I mean, disc brakes are actually more efficient on a, on a, on a number of levels. What is another thing that, that drum brakes have got a problem with that disc brakes don't? Anybody know? We talked about it the other day. I'm thinking there's more liability for mechanical issue. Somewhat. There's more moving parts. But on the other hand, you've also got, to, and that's a, that's a good point. Internal leakage? Yeah. And well, yes and no. You can, calipers can leak, but brakes are, the drum brakes are more likely to. Another thing is if you run through water, uh, drum brakes just about lose all their braking ability. You know, because it gets, the water gets trapped in that drum and it just makes it slippery. And so you don't have that problem with disc. And drum brakes don't dissipate heat as well as disc brakes. You get me? Have you ever seen these disc rotors with holes drilled through them? That's yeah. for heat dissipation. That's what it's for. Yeah, rotors. that's right. That's like in, even on your motorcycles, you'll see disc brakes with lines in them. You know, I mean, them uh, sort of spiral looking lines cut in them and they all have holes drilled through them. Mm -hmm. Every bit of that's for heat dissipation. The little, the little, um, where you, it looks like you got uh, on the front, you'll have a little rear, uh, fins in between the two halves of the rotor. You know, that's for heat dissipation too. Uh, but on the rear brakes, which don't work quite right as hard as the front brakes, you, a lot of times you'll just have solid rotors. Ever so often, you'll see solid rotors on the front of an Asian-made car. And more and more, uh, the place the, uh, dealerships and stuff are doing machine their machine and brake rotors while on the car. You know, because you have fewer issues with that. But a really expensive machine, you know, I got one that can do that. But, you know, I just basically, you know, we do that. Sometimes the brake rotors are really aggravating to change out. Some of the Honda cars and stuff, you know, some of the Asian-made cars, it's real hard to get those brake rotors off of there. And back home, you got to pull all kinds of crud off to get them off. 
and that's one of the cases, cases when you want to do them. Uh, we did do uh, rear brakes, machine them on the car on a Mercedes one time, about five, six years ago, when I didn't have anything that would talk to a Mercedes. Because in this part of the country, most of the cars you see are Asian or they're domestic. You don't see a lot of European stuff here. And so I never really got the stuff uh, to talk to a Mercedes, even with the, the software that I had then. I've got something now that will, but I didn't in those days. And after we machined the brakes on the vehicle, we wound up with an ABS light. <laughs> and I couldn't even talk to that thing to find out why the ABS light was on, but I cleaned all the filings off of the, you know, the magnets and everything on the wheel speed sensor, but that ABS light stayed on. Uh, but anyway, she had to get that looked at somewhere else, and I told her, you know, sorry about that, best I can do, you know. Um, let's see, a proportioning valve is a valve that delays fluid flow to the front brakes. Well, a me I don't know about that now. A metering valve reduces the amount of braking force at the rear wheels to prevent rear wheel lockup. Uh, that's number six. That's actually false. That's all fouled up and backwards and upside down and crooked. Uh, the proportioning valve is actually going to restrict fluid flow to the back brakes until the front ones have applied so you don't go into a skid when you're going around a curve. You ever gone into a skid when you're going around a curve, Willie? That's scary, isn't it? You know, you know. All right, so uh, during master cylinder bench bleeding. Who's done bench bleeding in here? You have. Who else? You did, and who else did it with you? Somebody's working with you on that. Uh, Webb, I think. Webb was working with you, okay. All right. All right, so, yeah, he worked with you on that. So, but anyway, during master cylinder bench bleeding, bleed lines are run uphill to a clean catch container. You know, you're going to run them uphill. What are you going to do that for? You're basically going to run them back into the master cylinder. So that, that's false. You're actually going to go right back into the, you're going to come out of the, the, line, the little plastic lines that they're made with little cones. You can stick them in the, uh, they come with it. And you'll actually see them in the box when you buy a master cylinder. And, um, huh? Oh, yes. Let's see. We'll fix that up right there, I think. Uh, that's it. Bring it back to me. Untangle that. I don't know what's going on there. All right. Now then, uh, let me see. Where are we at now? Eight. Number eight. When forcing the air out of the master cylinder during a bench bleed, the pistons can be moved using a wooden dowel. You know, and most of the time we use a screwdriver, but you can use a wooden dowel if you want to. Uh, a Phillips screwdriver works a little bit better than that because it's got a kind of a pointy end on it, you know. Uh, during a master cylinder bench bleed, the primary and secondary pistons usually need to be pushed only once to drive all the air from the cylinders. Well, that's hooey. You're going to have to work in things. Uh, and once again, guys, if you don't bench bleed it, you're going to end up having to bleed all the brakes. Who, who in here does not want to have to bleed all the brakes if they can get out of it? <laughs> Anybody that's done it is going to say, we don't want to have to do this if we ain't got to. So, you, so if you ain't got to bleed all the brakes, don't bleed all the brakes. However, if the pedal don't feel right, you best be bleeding. I mean, it's just, you know, don't... So putting that out, and also when you're bleeding the brakes, make darn sure that uh, it feels good with the engine started too, because it, sometimes it won't. Sometimes you'll feel like I'm, oh man, I swear I got all these things good. And then you crank it up, the pedal goes all the way to the floor because that booster's helping. So you need to go ahead and bleed it so that the, pit, the uh, brakes feel really good, the pedal feels really good, even with the engine running. Uh, so you're gonna if you when you think you're done, crank it up, see how it feels with the engine running, you know. And uh, this is another thing, this little axiom I'm always telling everybody. Anytime you get to the point to where you're just sick of the job and you just want to be done with it, you're going to mess it up. Yeah, you're going to mess it up. I mean, you need to actually go the extra mile to make sure that that thing is just like it ought to be. But if you say, I'm sick of this, I just want it out of my service bay. I don't care if the car burns down or gets run over by a truck. I just want it out of here. You know, you know what I'm saying? And you, you know, you'll get to the point where you feel that way. But, I mean, you need to, you need to get, a, get a grip on your emotions and say, look, I have got to make this. Every job is a picture of the person that did it, and I'm not letting it out of here until it's right. You get where I'm going? I mean, uh, and don't beat yourself up if you make a mistake every now and then, because we all do. You know what I'm saying? Many vehicles with front disc and rear drum, drum brakes have a four-function combination valve. A four-function, yeah, and that's false. Okay. The, okay, now these are multiple guess. Yay! The, uh, <coughs> the output piston in a hydraulic system exerts five times the force that the apply piston exerts. Why is the output force greater? In other words, if somebody gave you that a piece of information that the output piston was exerting five times the force the apply piston exerts, 
uh, what would you be able to give them for an answer? A, the output piston moves five times as far as the apply piston. That ain't right. No. Okay, B, the area of the output piston is five times as large as the area of the apply piston. How's that answer look? That kind of looks good. That sounds right to me if you know anything about Pascal's Law, right? Okay, you know, we're, gonna, we're not even going to read those other two bad answers. To multiply the output force of a hydraulic system, what do you have to do? Output piston with a larger head. That's going to be a. That's actually going to be a, a C, right? Mm -hmm. Use an output piston with a larger head. There you go. Uh, in an integral master cylinder, right? That means uh, what? Integral master cylinder. Whenever you talk about an integral master cylinder, that's one where the reservoir is made with the master cylinder. You know, most of them now have a, got an aluminum master cylinder, and then it's got a little reservoir popped on the top of it little plastic reservoir, mm -hmm. but the old, uh, you know, 68 Chevy and all, <laughs> they had a cast iron one with a master cylinder built on there with it. So number 13 is going to be a C. The reservoir is part of the master cylinder assembly. Number 14, a composite master cylinder. Number 14, a composite master cylinder. It has a plastic reservoir attached by rubber grommets. And I will tell you, sometimes you will buy a master cylinder and it will come with no reservoir. And you'll have to take the reservoir off the other one, clean it out, and pop it on the new one. Got me? All right, the replenishing port, uh, what is where? Number 15. Let's look at number 15. The replenishing port is A, located toward the front of the reservoir. Wrong. Uh, B, allows fluid to enter the high-pressure chamber. C, allows fluid to enter the low-pressure chamber. Oh, well, this right here is the kind of question that will scare the daylights out of you when you're taking your ASE test on brakes. Because you'll be sitting here looking at it and say, I don't even know what the replenishing port is. How am I supposed to answer this question right? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? See how, how important it is to, you got to burn this thing in in your mind so that you'll know what the right answer to that is without somebody just spoon feeding it to you. Is that right, y'all? All right. Yes, sir. All right. So, huh? So, yeah, so you want to know what the answer is. That's actually C. All right, that allows fluid to enter the low-pressure chamber. You might notice that's where I stopped reading. Okay, now then, we're going to go with number 16 here. Uh, number 16, which is not true of vehicles with disc brakes and a quick take-up master cylinder. See all these terms that you had never heard before? This is where you're going to get into your book. And you're going to find out what the deal is when they talk about these terms and everything. Uh, now, see, I'm not going to spoon, spoon feed everything to you. I'm going to encourage you to read some. Uh, okay. And number 16, that's actually going to be a C, the caliper piston. Excuse me. The secondary piston moves in a step bore cylinder. Uh, okay. So you need to look at a, a cross section of that. And it's got one in your book, right? Everybody's got a book, don't we? Uh, the purpose of bleeding a hydraulic brake system is, and this is a no-brainer here, guys. What's the reason you're bleeding the brakes? All the force yeah. trapped air out of the brake. Mm -hmm. Well, think about it. Look at all of them. That's all of the above. Now, sometimes when I'm taking a multiple choice test, sometimes, yeah, sometimes when I'm taking a multiple choice test, I'll machine gun the answers, and I'll miss one that's in all of the above. Because the first question, first right answer I see is the one I check. You know, bam, 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 bam. I say, oh, why did I miss that one? Well, it was in all of the above, and I only read the first right answer, and then I stopped there. I knew all of those. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you want to have a labor-intensive operation, you ought to go try to take an eight, all eight ASC tests at once. You know, because they're challenging. So. Yeah, pretty challenging. I mean, it takes a long time to do it. But they're doing them actually now over there on the Montgomery Highway at that uh, little uh, test center. Where you got it? You got to wear uh, what do you call it? So what happens if you don't pass all of them? Uh, you just spent the money and you go back and try it again later, but you got to pay again. Okay. You know. We don't have to take that. Uh, you don't have to, but you probably should and help you. I mean, what I'm saying is, they give you some credentialing, uh -huh. you know. And if somebody comes and says, you know, uh, you say if I, if you say, well, I went to school for this and I'm doing this, they say, well, that's pretty cool. And you say, but if you say I went to school and I've got this on my shirt, they're gonna say, hey, that guy must know something. It's, it's, I've seen people, I've seen good mechanics passed over for a job because they weren't ASE certified. See what I'm saying? I mean, so that's really a good thing. To, it's a credentialing thing. If you care enough about your credentials to where you go to the trouble to take that test, 
it's good. And if you've got, if you burn, if you burn the midnight oil or reading these books when you're getting ready for the test, I'm talking about like if you're going to take a particular test and you read the book, uh, you know, the part of the textbook that covers breaks and all that kind of stuff, and you burn that in, you'll typically sail through it. That's what that kid I got a uh, picture out there on the uh, glass that passed all eight of them. Yeah, he had actually been uh, through this program and he had been he had his head in the books. He was reading and he had a good head on his shoulders too. And he sailed through every one of them things the first time he took them. Only about 50% of the mechanics in the country that actually work on cars every day can pass those tests. Believe it or not. And these are guys that work on cars every day. And only about half of them can pass the doggone test. Or like 55%. That was the last numbers I got from the guy that works with ASE that I know. But um, anyway, uh, so let's see. So that's an all the above. Why is brake fluid pushed out during uh, manual bleeding? That's kind of dumb, you know. I mean, look at the answers that they're giving you. See? Uh, you push the brake pedal, it raises hydraulic pressure. <laughs> That's not complicated. Come on. You know, it's not, the bleeder hose is not going to act like a siphon, typically. You know, you maybe a little of that going on. The purpose of OSHA is to assure as far as possible uh, safe and helpful working conditions and to do what? That's actually a D. That's a D, preserve human resources. What that means is they don't want you to die on the job because something happened that shouldn't have happened. You got me? All right. You hear me? All right, all right. Does OSHA Which, ever come here? Huh? Does OSHA ever come here? No, they don't ever come here. They know that I got all everything covered. Uh, that's a joke. Actually, they may go more to the workplace than they do the. We're supposed to, you know, make you guys aware of what it, the OSHA. You know, like for instance, OSHA regulations. They actually do come here, but they haven't come to see me. I'll put that back. Um, you're uh, one of the things that's, that's OSHA in, in, intensive. Uh, that is just commonest thing in the world. You know, your little uh, plug that plugs into the wall, that third prong that goes in there for your ground. You better not have one of those. It's got that plug plug clipped. I mean, that clipped off. Her jerked out. They do not like that. I mean, anything like that that could fire you up. You know, you got to make sure that everything's as safe as it can be, and all that. You know, and they also uh, would probably be on me if they saw you know Webb in here wearing flip flops or house shoes or whatever he likes to try to come. Yeah, well, I heard you. Yeah, I was. Well, I was getting on him about that. I mean, and, and he he'll come up here dressed like he's gonna sit, just sit around at the house and watch TV all day or something. You know, or go to the beach. Yeah, or go to the beach or something. Yeah, that, that, uh, he used to try to work, come in here with flip flops on. And he'd lose the flip flops and put on some boots, you know. And so he he got to where he was bringing his boots with him. Drop on that toe one day. Yeah. Well, I would never let him work in here with flip flops on. I said if I let you do that, everybody will start that nonsense. And when them NATF people come, they're going to want to see everybody in uniforms, everybody in you know work shirt tail in. I mean, just like I don't see, see me dressed every day. Uh, you don't see me up here with a tank top, t-shirt, and blue jeans. You know, I'm not going. I don't set that kind of example. Uh, which of the following steps is done last during master cylinder bench bleeding? As you were. Uh, number C, the bleed lines are removed. Okay, you, you You're not through putting it back on the, what did I mess up? Did I leave something? Which of the ones did it first? That was 20, 20 is the one that I skipped. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Which of the following okay. steps is done first in master cylinder bench bleeding? What you got there? 20 is B. Let's be the master cylinder is mounted in a vise. Now, do not mount the master cylinder. Don't squeeze the barrel of the master cylinder. You're going to mount it by one of the ears, you know, by one of the little ears with a hole in it. Mount it by that. Don't squeeze it or you may distort it. You may destroy your master cylinder. You know what I mean? Don't put it in there sideways so you're squeezing the round part of the master cylinder that's got the bore on the inside of it. I saw somebody doing that the other day. <coughs> Turn it around and put it so that the, the, the place where the brake pedal goes is facing you. And, and pinch the ear, you know, where the bolt goes through the mountain master cylinder, you're going to pinch that device. That's how you're going to do that. All right. All right. That finishes this right here.